Well, oh, thanks very much, Russell. It's, uh, I think it, it might be my fifth time here uh, over a large number of years, so um, it kind of feels a bit like a second home. Um, and certainly uh, climate's better than uh, the snow that I apparently have left behind now. And we didn't have a summer, so I'm catching up on summer as well. Um, okay, uh, now um, I don't know how many of you saw the last presentation I gave a couple of years ago on Five Eyes. Um, anyone want to wave their hands? So, um, okay, well I have allowed um, some kind of catch up at the beginning, so those that are new will benefit from that. The others, um, I've tried to make it a, a coming at it from a bit of a different angle so that uh, you don't see the, the, the same old stuff again. Like I've just shuffled the order of the eyes. But, um, <laughs> and talking of eyes, you'll see mine flicking about like Ricky Gervais uh, because I've kind of got to look at you and I've got to look at the screen and so on. And it's obvious that AIC can't afford a, a, a lectern laptop. <laughs> um, right, so... Um, with those dire warnings, let's, um, let's head off. OK, so I'm going to be talking about the importance of good practice knowledge. Uh, what's wrong with the way we collect it? Um, and um, then I'll go into this knowledge management suite that I use to uh, try and uh, make amends and to, to help us put things right. And the purpose of that is improving the scope uh, and performance in um, in crime prevention um, at the practice level uh, but also at higher levels like policy and program delivery and so on um, and also feeding back into getting research uh, and evaluation and theory right and then of course they if they're done in applied context will feed back and, and help to improve practice in their turn um, uh, and you know as said um, I'll be using uh, a lot of detailed illustrations which I picked up when I spent some days in uh, the Irish Republic uh, back in 2008. Um, so who should be interested in good practice? Um, obviously practitioners, um, but people like delivery managers who are in charge of implementing um, national or regional or state programmes, policy makers, um, Public understanding and debate. Now, in the UK, we just uh, instituted a new way of controlling uh, the kind of accountability of police uh, through these local police crime, uh, police and crime commissioners. And um, for, for the first time, it's a major experiment. They've been elected rather than sort of seconded councillors. And we had a kind of uh, average 15% turnout. Um, and in, in some areas, they literally had no votes in the polling booths whatsoever. So anyway, um, public understanding and debate should be interested in crime prevention and how it works and what to do, but um, it needs a bit of a, um, a spur. Uh, governance levels and, of course, as I said, research and evaluation. So all these people uh, should be interested in good practice, but from different angles. Um, and um, the point is that good and bad practice can illustrate um, principles, it can challenge assumptions, it can test theories um, and extend our frontiers of thinking, which is what we, we all want to do. Um, why do we collect good practice information then, assuming that we do? Um, we want to improve performance and widen the scope of prevention, cover new problems, new solutions. We want to share technical knowledge of how to do it well. Um, we want to help practitioners avoid past mistakes. Um, we also want to motivate practitioners, um, the ones um, that are good at uh, improving their performance and uh, coming up with new ideas. Because if they then see that their ideas are taken, um, <coughs> distilled, fed back to other people and so on, then that, that is intensely motivating. Whereas if you, know, you just do something and it disappears down a black hole somewhere, then you know, ultimately why bother? Um, also, as well as uh, improving specific operations, trying to gradually increase the sort of culture and climate of quality of preventive action um, at all levels. Um, 
and uh, actually the German um, Beccaria program, uh, it's just beccaria.org, is um, very hot on uh, crime prevention quality and it's worth having a look at their website. So if you just Google Beccaria crime prevention, that will, that will come up. Um, and as I said, uh, feeding back to nourish theory and to, to test it because the only way we can really test our, our theories of crime and crime prevention is in practice, seeing if it makes a difference in the real world. So there's quite a lot remaining wrong with practice um, and that's illustrated by the ongoing dismal story of implementation failure. Um, and this affects programs of all kinds, from problem-oriented policing to um, communities that care. Every time I've been involved in any of these and looked at or participated in evaluations, it's quite often, uh, you know, it got so far but things went wrong and um, uh, either the evaluation failed or the implementation failed or more often than not, occasionally the theory behind the um, uh, the intervention fail, but it's more often an implementation failure story. Um, yes, I've kind of put there that when you mainstream one-off success story demonstration projects that work wonderfully, you try and replicate them en masse. Um, they rarely fail to disappoint. So people in the past have come up with a lot of um, fairly standard, uh, standard sort of liturgy of uh, explanations for these failures. Um, oh, you know, the, the project managers are, are pretty poor at uh, doing project management, which may be true. Um, practitioners aren't very good at doing analysis of crime patterns and problems and so on, which sometimes may be true, in other cases it might not be. Um, funding, certainly in the UK, has been on a really short-term basis. Uh, so you cannot build up the staff, you cannot build up the momentum and the experience before it all closes down, uh, or you've got to spend your money really quickly so you, you don't have the thinking <coughs> and designing and testing time before you have to uh, set your action going. Over-centralised management, organisational contexts which are unsympathetic and unsupportive, uh, mission drift. Um, these are all important, but uh, the factor that I've been focusing on some while is um, inadequate management of knowledge of practice. So this is a kind of top-level list of the kinds of knowledge that um, we need to gather and apply in, uh, in crime prevention. And it also, it's also pretty much uh, extensible to other fields like uh, uh, you could apply it to sort of health or education or something like that if any of you have got wider interests. Um, so knowing crime, um, very important to focus on, um, you know, we might say burglary or theft or robbery or something. Like that. People use the terms quite loosely, but if, uh, particularly if you're trying to design interventions to be quite specific, you, you need to think very clearly about you know, what makes a theft different from a robbery um, and focus your action accordingly. Um, know about your crime problems that you're tackling. What's the nature of the problem? What are the patterns and trends? What are the causes? Uh, who are the offenders? Who are the victims? And um, what are the harmful consequences? Um, know who to involve in getting crime prevention done. Um, now, um, my approach has taught quite a lot about involvement as a way of describing how you get other people, not necessarily professionals, to implement the interventions. But um, actually, only relatively recently, I became aware of uh, Lorraine Maserol and her um, approach, third-party policing. And um, you know, we had a session at University of Queensland a couple of days ago where we kind of shared our frameworks and uh, we actually realised we had an enormous amount in common so it's rather sad that I hadn't actually caught up on this um, while I was um, preparing some of my Five Eyes stuff uh, two or three years ago but from now on we decided to kind of link up because as Oscar Wilde might have said there's only one thing worse than having 
um, a sophisticated knowledge management framework that's having two sophisticated knowledge mm -hmm. management frameworks. Um, know when to act. A lot of crime prevention activities are um, not uh, implemented by themselves, but if, particularly you know, in high crime, um, multiple problem deprived areas, you'll find a whole lot of programs from different agencies. So how to interact uh, and coordinate and not mess up with those. Know where to distribute resources, targeting, prioritization, fairness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, know why. Um, okay, supposing you've been pursuing an evidence-based approach, and the evidence says the best way of tackling um, serious young offenders is to send them on expensive, kind of uh, outward bound, or, or even some of those fancy sailing schemes, and so on. Um, that may be the most cost-effective thing, but if you, if you have a sort of nationally or regionally funded program of that, the newspapers the next day will have this sort of major headline, you know, why are they sending these undeserving people on this when my little Johnny or Jill won't, uh, you know, um, as honest as a day is long and uh, they're not getting this. So um, it's that sort of issue that you have to, as a practitioner, and I'm not talking, you know, there's obviously a political dimension to that, but as a practitioner, you have to know how to anticipate these things and how to handle them quite carefully through communications and uh, setting of expectations and so on. Um, and if you don't have that, then your project will probably um, collapse in some kind of disgrace, irrespective of the fact that it's probably a damn good, a damn good project. Um, know how brings all of this together. Um, and each of these realms of knowledge, um, you can actually look at them um, from a practice point of view right up to sort of uh, um, delivery, policy making and, and governance. So that's kind of underlying frame for what crime prevention knowledge is about. Um, so what's wrong with our good practice knowledge? Um, and a lot of what's wrong is uh, how we capture that knowledge through process and impact evaluation and how we manage it. Um, a lot of our knowledge remains tacit and unarticulated. Um, so that means it's not tested, um, it's not properly transferred between um, individual practitioners on a team, uh, between teams or between programs. Um, <coughs> And that knowledge is kind of lost and frequently reinvented. Um, and if it's good knowledge, it's reinventing the wheel. And if it's bad knowledge, it's reinventing the flat tire. Um, and uh, we tried to, we did a publication, Karen Bullock and I, a colleague from the UK, um, criticizing a really pathetic UK home office knowledge base of effective practice. Um, and um, we were going to call the whole article reinventing the, pl the flat tire at the home office. We became very, very upset. So we thought, we, you know, we'd better not alienate them too much in case we need funding in the future. So we ended up, we chickened out and called it richness, retrievability and reliability. Um, so there's this failure to handle the complexity of um, choice, delivery and action that, you know, real world crime prevention requires to do it properly. That's a theme I, I've uh, spoken about when I've been here before. Um, so a particular interest in know what works and know how, which I'll be focusing on as we, as we go. Um, so these are the basic ways, thinking from now on from the practitioner's um, perspective, sort of user perspective of um, knowledge basis, knowledge management. Um, Practitioners uh, need help in selecting intervention methods that they can apply um, to their problem and their context. We want these, where possible, to be evidence-based, um, appropriate for the priorities uh, and responsibilities of the organisations that are uh, um, implementing them. Unfortunately, a lot of the Know What Works information, you know, you've seen, well, many of you have seen Campbell, collaboration reviews and so on, very one-dimensional. They focus on things like effect size and cost effectiveness and so on, which is absolutely vital if you can get it. 
um, but it's not nearly enough. And the kinds of information that I'll be describing um, shortly will illustrate uh, what I mean by not enough. Um, so selecting from prior knowledge of practice. Um, and when they've chosen things that they think they might emulate in their circumstances, uh, they need to replicate them. But if you look at um, process evaluations, either they're too simple to be of much use, or um, they're actually full of stuff, but it's all over the place, and it takes ages to dig it out and select what's relevant to your circumstances. And it's probably not cross-linked to other um, um, projects and practices, so you can kind of make a choice at one point rather than just being forced to copy one. Um, now, in many cases, uh, when you go to the cupboard, it will be bare. Uh, there won't be prior uh, exemplars for you to look at and emulate. Um, there, uh, there, there won't be evaluations. Um, your problems might be new ones. Your context will almost certainly be new ones. So uh, what that <coughs> means is that practitioners don't just replicate they have to innovate and how, how do we help practitioners to be innovative and creative uh, whilst at the same time being kind of disciplined relating to in ongoing theory and evidence. Um, so the question is, is our theoretical and practical knowledge good enough in its content and organisation to support um, innovation? Do the good practice descriptions that we do uh, contain the right information to help replicate and innovate? Um, replication is a challenge. Um, context is important uh, and replication or well, descriptions of, of practice don't often record enough of what was special about the local context when they did it uh, so you can make a judgment about you know, what you need to do uh, when you do it in your context. Um, there's been too much of a tendency for cookbook copying, uh, copying something too closely um, without adapting it to your local circumstances. And it, that, that, generally speaking, doesn't work, kind of unwritten law of crime prevention. Uh, cookbook copying doesn't work. And practitioners, um, you know, who aspire to, um, you know, being proper intelligent practitioners rather than uh, technicians actually hate the lack of discretion. Um, and you actually get this, uh, sometimes uh, youth justice projects have been very, very hot on, uh, you know, you must absolutely do this, this, this and this when you're implementing this or it's not actually um, um, implementing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the details of the program and um, um, that can be, uh, somebody once described it as um, program fetishism. So you, you've got, it's a bit difficult striking the balance between copying you know, a successful end product of some intervention success story, um, copying the intelligent process that generated that success story but if you apply the process in your context, it might come up with something a bit different. Um, and copying the organisational capacity for pursuing that um, intelligent <coughs> process. So, I mean, things like communities that care try to replicate the organisational capacity in different areas. And then those organisations, when they're created, they then go on to uh, replicate the individual innovations. So. A lot of practice and a lot of practitioner activity and inter-practitioner communication is very sort of tacit. Um, when you, some of the old home office knowledge bases simply had about half a paragraph on what a project did and then contact details for, you know, this is the practitioner to get in touch with. And this of course is highly dependent on having very able or sometimes charismatic practitioners and they'll move on, they'll maybe die with their boots on. Um, and, you know, they may not be there, they may uh, have insufficient time to talk to you. You know, a really popular project might get dozens of phone calls or emails. Um, so, 
you either get practitioners operating at uh, two extremes. In some cases, they've got kind of an anarchic total freedom of manoeuvre where they end up uh, uncertain quality assurance and um, mission drift, or, as I said, forced into this role of technicians rather, consultant, rather than consultants. And of course, in many cases, there's a limited career structure, limited organisational reward, um, and it's not worth either for them or for their, uh, their managers investing in their training. And of course, there's this trend towards organisational churn nowadays. You know, you're in a... Um, a particular post for two or three years at most and then you go off and somebody else has got to pick up that knowledge. So as I said, um, innovation is a vital part of replication. Um, but um, if we look at our knowledge base as a whole, its coverage is limited because we can't do evaluations to cover every different problem, every different context. Um, new configurations of causes, risk and, protect fact, risk and protective factors and so on. The nature of crime is always changing, uh, new tools, new weapons. You know, with youth crime particularly, you get new fashions. They'll all be off doing some other uh, way of committing a nuisance uh, next year. Um, and of course, you'll get new themes and balances within justice or the balance between justice and privacy or um, enforcement and so on. So, again, major capacity for innovation is important here. And how do we do this? We need to draw on generic principles and theory to, so that practitioners can keep coming up with plausible ideas for their um, uh, innovative actions. You need some sort of recombinant facility. It sounds a bit like DNA. In some ways, it, it resembles that, really. Um, don't just try and copy big units like whole projects, but break action down into uh, really small um, details. So, for example, the burglary project, which might not have worked very well, there might be a, an extremely good uh, bit of practice knowledge that they developed on how to mobilise people. And you can junk what they did on burglary, but you can salvage the... Um, um, the, uh, the mobilisation technique and use it in a car crime project or something. So does your good practice description enable that? And can you find it when you go looking for it? Um, when you innovate, incidentally, it's probable that what you come up with isn't going to be quite right. So um, the whole, you follow the whole kind of design process of trying it out rapid prototyping, iterating, improving, feedback, and so on. Um, so um, it's not a one-shot intervention. And you know, try not to design your projects so that they only have one chance of getting it right. Uh, we had a minister once who said he didn't believe in pilot projects. <laughs> there we go. Um, these things are sent to try us. So looking at the kind of good practice descriptions that appear on your knowledge basis. Do the, do the good practice descriptions contain the right information and the right detail to help replicate them innovatively and intelligently in different contexts? So um, those glossy summaries, um, the practical methods, uh, there's not enough to help you replicate them. Uh, they don't emphasise the underlying generic principles or mechanisms uh, which do transfer between contexts. Uh, and you get really, really infuriating things like our projects about working with young people. You know, um, it's kind of triumph of enthusiasm over uh, communication. And it's imprecise and it confuses two things here. It confuses things like outreach activities with the actual intervention once you've got the young people to work with, what exactly are you doing with them? Um, process evaluations absent or limited, it's kind of the, the, the poor kid brother or sister of um, impact evaluation. Um, so it's, it's difficult, you know, sort of thinking slightly archaeologically, it's difficult to reconstruct the um, unfolding stages of action. Um, uh, there's little information about the choices and trade-offs that have to be faced at different stages. And, you know, you might be going through the same process, but 
uh, in different contexts, the practitioners might want to make different choices. So the end product ends up quite different. So um, my attempt to get to grips with these shortcomings is the sort of suite which includes the Five Eyes framework, but also includes things like defining crime prevention, community safety and partnership in some depth, which I won't do uh, today. Um, clarifying what we mean by action, what's the action focused on, what sort of units of action have we got, what levels. Conjunction of criminal opportunity is, is to, it's a way of looking at immediate causes of criminal events in a systematic way um, and um, providing a map of the interventions in those causes. Five Eyes is this sort of process model for how we do crime prevention. This is the know-how side. Uh, it's a way of describing all the detailed tasks of the preventive process so you can capture it um, and uh, disseminate it. I started this out um, with a focus on um, sort of the problem and initially the situational side of crime prevention, but had this opportunity to uh, spend uh, some days in uh, Ireland, um, which enabled me to extend it to the offender-oriented side. So here we go. Um, Irish eyes and hence all these sort of green bits in this which are slightly thematic. Um, I'll explain about them later. Uh, okay, so visited <coughs> 10 youth centres uh, in Dublin and Limerick over two days in 2008 and um, I don't know if any of you know Limerick, it, it, to outsiders it sounds romantic but locally it was known as Stab City and um, <laughs> Bits of the outlying suburbs, they, they, they looked a bit like uh, Beirut, you know, literally arsonised houses and so on. And that was 2008, that was before they hit their financial troubles, so heaven knows what, what it's like now. Um, each of these youth centres, I had a kind of working discussion for about an hour, loosely structured around Five Eyes headings uh, with um, the youth centre staff and the partners in the... Uh, uh, in the Garda, um, probation and local volunteers and so on. And um, we discovered lots of items of knowledge um, uh, at, at um, a range of uh, levels from sort of tactical to the strategic. And I kind of um, reflected back at them what they said in informal terms, in, in slightly more structured terms. And we, we, we got on really well uh, generating lots of new bits of knowledge, some new categories, and it actually started challenging some parts of the, um, the knowledge framework, which was you know, really good because Five Eyes meant to be this sort of learning engine. Previous experiences, I'd had an intense sort of three hour session with one project, but this was um, jumping around, picking up loads of mini illustrations, which will kind of appear as follows. Here you go, it's interesting what they're up to in Ireland. <laughs> It's actually scrapings off the top of Guinness, but no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so clarifying the focus of, um, of action, um, something we don't actually talk about very much in crime prevention practice. I mean, you can focus on problems, or you can focus on offenders, you can focus on causes, or in the youth um, context, much more often it's about risk and protective factors for in childhood for later offending. Um, and you can, uh, you can take a narrow or a broad scope, criminal events, civil conflicts, quality of life, community safety. Um, now, in many of these youth um, centres, they weren't interested in crime and safety as a main <coughs> focus. They were really interested in wider issues such as, uh, you know, improving young people's lives. Um, inclusion, cohesion, education and renewal and so on. So, you know, your crime prevention activity may be serving part of these wider goals of, or vice versa. Uh, and you have to understand that um, when you're documenting it and describing it. Um, you know, when you actually talk about the bits and pieces of crime prevention, there are a whole load of different um, uh, structural elements from programs down to these sort of transferable action bits like the one that kept coming up was sort of 
insurance for uh, outdoor activities. And from an academic point of view, it's, it's not very exciting knowledge, but from a practical point of view, you need to be able to find it and share it. Um, and if one project, one centre has done a lot of work sorting that out, then you know, other centres need to be able to find it. Um, so, um, what's the nature of the intervention? Um, focusing on causal mechanisms, how the intervention methods work in detail. Um, um, generic principles like, uh, you know, this one works through developing trusting relationships with role models. Practical methods is another way of describing things. So, uh, you know, okay, we're doing fishing trips for deprived young people. And then whole packages of uh, methods such as a sort of they will come up with a whole suite, a whole program of centre-based and out outdoor activities. Um, what is the ecological level that your interventions are operating at? Individual, family, peer group, etc., etc. And talking to these practitioners in, in Ireland, they actually seem quite adept at using different levels. They, they um, said, right, okay, we're going to do some one-to-one -one work here and we're also going to be doing group work there. But they're even more dynamic, the more experienced ones, because um, they, 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 would be, they would assess each morning when individuals drifted into the youth centre. If they were uptight and you know, really anxious and a bit aggressive that morning, you say, right, you're not going into the group work today, we'll do some one-to-one -one with you. Um, or we'll switch to um, a family visit or something like that. So, you know, they, part of their knowledge was actually when to, what these different levels were and when to switch between them. So that, that's pretty skilled, pretty, pretty impressive stuff. Um, the action is also placed in different institutional settings, you know, enforcement and justice, welfare, education, crime prevention and so on. Single agency or partnership, localised or centralised. Um, some of these youth centre people were actually very adept at navigating between these uh, different institutional perspectives and not only just coping with it, but actively exploiting it. You know, right, um, so far things haven't worked on a kind of welfare perspective, so I think we'll, we'll try a little bit of the hard stuff with uh, um, um, a, a bit more justice and then we'll come back to the welfare when we've secured a bit of compliance from the parents or something. Um, so on to causes and interventions. Um, and here we have the dreaded ECK block again, I'm afraid. This is the conjunction of criminal opportunity, which is a, a way of systematically describing the immediate causes of criminal events, um, focusing partly on the offender um, their criminality, their immediate motivation to offend, their perception of risk, effort and uh, reward and so on. And then round to uh, the environment, the target, uh, preventers or guardians and crime promoters who make crime more likely to happen, like the guy that stuffs the pizza delivery leaflet in your letterbox, leaving it half hanging out, telling everybody that you're out all day. Thanks. You know. um, so, um, I can illustrate this now with um, some of the Irish examples. Um, so some of the issues that were coming up in these workshops um, on criminality, aggressiveness, no respect for girls and women or property, quite a lot of problems, cruelty to animals, um, poor job skills, they can't get up in the morning, um, etc. Um, they were bored out of their minds on these sort of satellite housing estates. Overcrowding was causing stress for them. Um, they had the usual range of resources to commit crime, weapons, tools, and so on. You know, hence Stab City. Um, that's nothing particularly Irish or youth offender oriented about that. Uh, they were actually, a, a lot of them just hadn't kind of got uh, the capacity to feel guilt about what they're doing um, and um, kids were hanging around on the street awaiting action so obviously they were, they were present in the crime situation. Um, target people, 
uh, firefighters were often seen as enemies, um, you know, because of these sort of arson events going on. So they vandalized the fire uh, trucks and so on and so forth. Um, poor perimeter security around the shops and houses, so they're breaking in and stealing things. <coughs> the layout of the streets is really suited to joyriding. Um, the environment contained very little for them to do uh, except create a nuisance and just hang around. The parents weren't acting as crime preventers, they were sort of failing to socialise and supervise their kids. Um, there were no good role models around. Um, crime promoters, they were all acting as crime promoters for each other. There was this terrible envy culture, so anybody was trying to better themselves, then, you know, the finger was pointed, you know, you're a SWAT or, 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 or worse. Um, and um, actually, it was so boring there that when kids nicked a car and went joyriding around the housing estates, the whole street would come out and kind of, you know, it was their local, uh, you know, Monte Carlo rally or whatever. Um, so um, this is how CCO describes interventions. Um, you, let's say, well, in this case, trimming shrubs in a hospital car park to stop people leaping out and mugging people. Um, that's an intervention in one of the causes, uh, reduces or it disrupts the conjunction of all these causes that have to come together for the crime to happen, reduces the risk of criminal events, which is crime prevention, objective crime reduction, and wider benefits, in this case, sort of improvement of quality of life for the people visiting the hospital and the patients. Um, so. Each of the causes, um, you can describe um, a counterpart family of interventions. So this gives you a, a map or a menu of interventions whenever you, whenever you come up with a crime problem. It helps you to choose which ones to address. And I won't grind through them in great detail, but again, I'll just, it's all online, but you can uh, see some of these um, interventions which the Irish came up with. So, um, one of the things they were working with, stabling skills, which was very good for sort of calming them, um, helping them develop a better relationship with animals and giving them some sort of positive things uh, in their repertoire. Um, couldn't get up, so they started out, the kids that came to the youth centre, all right, you can come in in the afternoon, and then gradually they, they demanded that they came in earlier and earlier in the day, so they gradually got the habit of getting up and making appointments and so on. Um, boredom, um, they worked on the same activities that the kids had been doing illegitimately and creating a nuisance, but trying to do them in a legitimate context, like you know, motocross and organised environments and so on. Um, restricting resources for fending, like removing bricks and bottles from the town centre on Friday afternoons. Um, teaching moral choice. Um, trying to deflect offenders off the streets and into centres and activities. Um, you know, standard situational stuff of target hardening and target removal. Um, uh, that's another situational one, I won't go into that. Um, environmental design, you know, restricting the kinds of places where they could hang out, uh, creating youth facilities like youth centres and youth shelters and so on. Um, Mobilising people to act as preventers, and that could have been each other, using group pressures. Uh, if somebody stole, say, the slide projector or something like that at the school, um, utilising group pressures to get people to return stolen goods and so on. Um, one quite interesting thing, they didn't target, with, with these joyriding problems, they, they didn't target the offenders directly and say, you shouldn't be doing this. They actually did a video which they showed to sort of uh, uh, the grandmothers and the aunties and so on who were um, uh, on the housing estate showing all the nasty consequences. So they, they pretty quickly stopped cheering these people on. So they didn't get an audience and uh, um, it became less rewarding. Um, so that is causes and interventions. And then Five Eyes, this process model of how you do um, prevention. Um, intelligence is about causes, 
um, as I said, um, and the nature of the problem and consequences and who's doing it. Intervention is kind of what you do in principle. Um, implementation is how you make it work in practice. Involvement ha is how you get all these other people to help you put it into practice. Uh, that's the one that links up with third party policing. And then impact, does it work and uh, how good is the process? So I'm not going to grind through all the five eyes in detail, you'll be relieved to hear, but this just illustrates the, the layered structure of it. So at the, mes the message level is just the slogan, intelligence, intervention, etc. That then breaks down into a whole series of subheads of topics which are called the map level. So causes, risk and protective factors, consequences and so on. And then you break that down. So under uh, causes you've got the conjunction of criminal opportunity framework. Um, and then you break it down even further, what I call the meat. Now when I was in Ireland I did some sort of huge, great, massive Irish pork chop or something like that. But here I thought I'd, I'd uh, I use a floater. I've never managed to get a floater yet. Um, I was told they sold them uh, at some um, caravan by the by the station in Adelaide, but it wasn't there, so uh, help needed. Or maybe I just had to make one at home. If anybody's got a recipe, uh, so that takes you right down to um, the specific detail. And of course, with this structure, you not only know where to put that detail, you know where to find it again uh, in retrievability terms. Um, so these are the kinds of headings under um, intelligence um, and some of the Irish examples. So in the sort of social and geographical context, they were quite concerned about how you get a, a, a criminal family moving en masse into a particular estate and then intimidating other residents. Um, they, they gathered not just evidence on crimes but on person, individual people, and their criminal careers as well. Um, intelligence, not about the crime problem, but about how you get involved with other agencies. Knowledge of what the other agencies' uh, responsibilities uh, and methods were um, before you then start setting up partnerships with them. Um, you also have to be quite careful when you're sharing knowledge with your other institutional partners and the youth centres often deliberately didn't ask about the offending history of the young people they, you know, when they were working with probation or the Garda. Um, the crime problems, you know, obviously example disorder or racist abuse on school buses or smashing up the fire engines. Wider problems than these individual events in isolation, drugs, family feuding and so on is a big problem there. Um, wider social problems within which crime was perhaps a symptom or a, uh, something which made matters worse, uh, like you know, health, education, gender relations. Consequences, and you know, quite practical consequences sometimes. If you came from this housing estate in Limerick, then you, know, you might as well kiss goodbye to um, getting a job, you know, the moment the uh, potential employer asks you to fill in a form and say where you came from or you, you know, opened your mouth and said that in the job interview, you know, goodbye. Um, then obviously causes and um, the dynamics of what's going on. Um, intervention, uh, intervening in causes or uh, changing those risk and protective factors. This links up with kind of thing that um, offender-oriented or social intervention people are interested in, theories of change, realistic evaluation. So we can start by describing practical methods like fishing trip activities. One such method might work in a number of different ways. Uh, so you then start thinking about analytic principles. How is it working? Use the CCO to, look, to go around the clock of that diagram. So, you know, affecting predisposition by teaching calmness. And they, they said respect for animals, but I, if I had a dirty great fish hook in my mouth, I don't think I'd feel terribly respected, but never mind. I suppose if I was then stuffed and mounted on the wall somewhere, maybe I would, um, posthumously. Um, so resources to avoid planning, uh, to avoid offending, 
They were doing things like learning, planning and budgeting of um, these fishing trips and this doubles to, in helping out the implementation of the trip. Learning teamwork, even things like making and selling fishing flies, um, alleviating boredom um, and, um, you know, the, the decision to offend, if, if, you, if you risk losing the right of going on more of these nice trips in future, if you, you know, that was something meaningful to hang over you, to deter you from offending again. And then, you know, giving them positive motivation to do honest activities by making a lot of trophies and items in the local newspaper and so on. Um, obviously removing offenders from the crime situation and also developing relationships with positive role models. Um, so involvement, as I said, is um, acting through or with other parties than the youth centre or the police. Um, and um, there were a whole raft of activities which came up here which I'll, I'll skip over. This just shows quite a few of these headings actually in Five Eyes, particularly things like outreach and um, demand actually came from my Irish visits. I hadn't got them in before which shows that, you know, as you, as you go around, you're, you're not only collecting knowledge using the framework, but you're, from time to time, you're actually continuing to build um, the, um, the, the framework. Um, so, um, stuff on partnership, strategic level of partnership. Um, building connections with, you know, how do they build connections between the youth centre and the sort of wider justice family of agencies, getting on the local probation project management committee and vice versa, discussing with other agencies what activities are to be done with these young people on whose premises. And operationally they did a lot of partnership building with the parents of the, the young offenders. Uh, they'd set up parent meetings if the problem arises and very, very, very practical techniques for every negative issue that you discuss with the parent that little Johnny or Jilly has been doing, uh, make sure that you discuss three positives first, the so-called compliment sandwich. Um, and, you know, again, it's very small, it's very practical, but, you know, it's a very useful bit of experience to be able to share. Um, other things like agreement with the local Garda that no young person was ever to be picked up whilst on youth centre activity or at the youth centre. It, uh, it's kind of means of preserving trust between the young person and the, and, uh, and, and the youth centre. It's a major operational issue. Um, so how, how do they get other um, people and organisations to implement these interventions? And here we come to this claimed framework for mobilisation. Locating the right person for the job, and they, they, they were trying to find expert supervisors for these fishing projects or for volunteer staff or a community rep. Um, it's actually an unfortunate pun there, which I didn't notice before. Trawling organisations for, <laughs> for these uh, angling societies, um, finding local angling enthusiasts who are the right kind of people to do this. Alert them that they could help prevent crime inform them and, and just jumping to the joyriding audience again you know you are helping to make these uh, dangerous car thefts happen by your uh, you know acting as an audience uh, motivate them things like um, okay uh, the parents get very pleased because their kids have been taken off their hands um, so that's the carrot and in extreme cases um, well, alleviation of sticks. So if you, if you send your, your kid to the youth centre, um, then we'll work with the housing people to give a conditional stay of an eviction order. But obviously, they only do that in really extreme circumstances. Um, empowering the uh, volunteers by uh, training um, and directing them. You know, obviously, they have to work with sort of health and safety and child safety rules. Um, Climate setting is sort of establishing conditions of mutual trust and expectation and so on in support of preventive action. Staffing continuity is important so that trusting relationships can, can develop. But how do you then handle changeovers of staff? 
um, particularly the Irish, then were changing over from locally originating projects to something that was centrally managed. How do you handle serious incidents in the, in, in the youth centre? Um, how do you maintain good relations within the, um, the Garda, the police, between the juvenile and the uh, you know, uh, criminal catching arms? Um, it's important to try and make the resources of the youth centres available to a wide range of young people, not just offenders, that's that sort of sailboat issue I said before, uh, and to the wider community, uh, you know, elderly people, adult education and so on. So you're, you're building this complete trust and facility. Then outreach um, is a major activity um, and um, you know, involve things like building trust on the street so that you could then get the young people to come in through the doors. What do the, uh, what do the street workers do if they see the young people doing bad things? They don't immediately call the police. They sort of try and maintain trust by saying, you know, should you really be doing that? Uh, yeah, I should. Um, what next? Um, that's another bit of knowledge which I didn't pick up. Um, Softly, softly approach. You don't talk about crime at first. You gradually get round to it after you've got to know them. Volunteering is a major issue. Um, must be voluntary participation, if at all possible, rather than forcible participation. Anticipatory mobilisation of clients so that, you know, if you know that somebody is at risk but they haven't done anything yet, you actually start to get to know them on the street so that, um, you know, when they do start doing wrong things and need to be pulled in, then they've already kind of got social handles of relationship with you. Um, quite interesting. Um, how do you, once they're through the doors, how do you maintain motivation and keep them in? There's a kind of career structure for them, of gradually building responsibility and status in the centre. Um, and how do you maintain continuity if they have to go off to prison? Um, and uh, what do you do post-release? Um, there's a whole lot of stuff on um, the organisational level um, and um, you know, how you develop the capacity to anticipate and react to new problems as they come up. Um, and uh, some interesting things about uh, continuity. Um, the centres were quite keen on checking out whether the, the tutors and the volunteers were buying into the values and the philosophy of the centre. And they've, they've developed techniques for constructive feedback to keep them on track. And there was one place that was really clever. Each month of their team meetings, a different staff member was assigned the role of keeper of the values. So they had to sit back partly and listen. If somebody was drifting off message or off mission, they had to sort of speak up and say, do we really want to do this? Or you know, if so, let's make a collective explicit decision or otherwise let's go back on course. Um, so, um, yes, uh, I think I'll, I'll leave this behind and pe people can kind of uh, um, read some of these things because I'm beginning to run out of time. Um, the um, impact is obviously important and um, because Ultimate impact is quite often long term, you know, 10 years down the line, how are these young people doing? Did they reduce their offending? Did they get a good life? Um, so you've got to do a lot of intermediate uh, outcomes like maintaining attendance at the centre, completing a qualification, uh, feeling a lot happier, etc. Um, ultimate outcomes, not just crime, but, uh, you know, they've got a job, they've got girlfriends, they're into further education and so on. The area benefits, uh, the firefighters are no longer too scared to attend or they get a postal service back or the school bus comes back and so on. Um, and, um, you know, loads of issues about sustainability um, and replicability. Now, just a couple of closing slides on how, you know, Five Eyes worked and how I extended and adapted it in this, in this context. It was, it was quite a challenge and following Piaget's ideas of adaptive learning from you know, individual development, sometimes you can assimilate new knowledge. So, you know, 
This is where you kind of place new knowledge items that you come across uh, on an existing framework. So, for example, um, practical arrangements for um, implementation. One really nice bit that I learned was uh, if you take a bunch of hard and deprived kids on a fishing trip, do not, whatever you do, uh, stop off in a little village and let them uh, go in and buy their own lunch in the sleepy little village shop. So they sort of wreck the place and clean it out. Um, and you know, I mean, from, a, from an academic point of view, that's trivial, but from a practical point of view, you know, it could blow the reputation of the centre out of the water. Um, the media are always um, biased towards negative stories of the, um, the clients, or participants, or members. Um, some of the youth centres were bypassing this by putting their success stories directly on YouTube. Um, accommodation is a kind of exceptional activity of modifying or adding branches to the framework itself. Um, and as I said, outreach was a completely new thing which I hadn't thought of from my earlier experience, so I then added that onto, um, onto Five Eyes. And another one which I slightly anxious it might end up being a new eye, but at least it begins with like, initiation and exit, how youngsters are actually identified and, and, and drawn into an organisation or re referred onto it. So with, in just this two days, 10 centres, we picked up about 129 separate items at all these different levels. Um, there's a vast amount of knowledge, you know, probably still to capture. Uh, waiting to be sort of collected, scrutinised, refined, assembled, shared. Um, and these thematic focus groups worked, um, worked really well. Um, and the people enjoyed it, they were very enthusiastic. Um, that could be kind of done on a systematic basis. Um, and um, Jess, you were talking about this uh, practitioner to practitioner forum, weren't you? Well. Um, you know, that would be another way of doing it. And you could use all the Five Eyes stuff as headings, red, ready-made heading for people to sort of talk about particular themes. You know, this is where you go if you want to learn about insurance. Uh, this is where you go if you want to learn about not smashing up village shops. Um, oh, you, know, you don't do that sort of thing over here, do you? No, no. Um, after action reviews is another technique. Um, that the UK National Health Service is doing and the US Army does, which maybe isn't a good advert. Um, a meeting after some project or after some casework to review good and bad aspects. Um, external facilitators are quite important. I didn't know very much at all about um, what was going on in youth centres when I started, but after about the third of the sessions, I was able to kind of reflect back to the practitioners um, and um, I identified what was newsworthy and what was sort of fairly widely known. So somebody that was sort of experienced and trained up in knowledge capture as, as well as the field would actually do it much more effectively. So that's it. And that's where you can find the stuff. And, you know, do collaborate if you want to. I'm, I'm free and eager to do that. Thank you.